Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. As the global pandemic continues to spread across our planet, we are watching different government systems try to apply different strategies to keep their people safe. On one extreme, we have China. After the Communist Party in Wuhan failed to cover up and contain the disease, the entire country was essentially shut down and martial law was enacted in the epicenter. People were literally not allowed to go outside for several days. Then we have South Korea's more high-tech approach, which included aggressively increasing their testing capabilities and using people's cell phones to track those who had become infected. Here in the United States, many of us are already seeing the symptoms of this growing storm as everything around us begins to shut down. I basically haven't been to our office in New York City for at least three weeks now. We have a pretty interesting system here which equally divides responsibility to different tiers of government, which means we're seeing a lot of miscommunication at the city, state, and federal level. Although our government's response has been a bit relaxed and delayed, I think in the next few weeks as the crisis reaches its peak, we as American citizens might even be asked to make certain sacrifices. In human history, individuals have taken advantage of crisis in order to seize control. Whether it was Hitler's rise in Germany when the Versailles Treaty bankrupt the Reich after World War I, or even George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq post 9-11. Now, I'm not comparing Bush to Hitler or both of those guys to our current administration. Each situation is unique in its own way. Um, and if we look at our current situation right now, Trump seems to be giving the local state governments a lot of leeway on how they want to handle the crisis in their own borders. But as things do reach their peak, there is the potential that certain extreme measures will be taken. And this applies not to just the Americans, but to every citizen in every country in the world. Whatever sacrifices we are going to be asked to make in order to stop this pandemic should be considered very rationally and without fear and emotion, which can be hard to do, which is why today we're going to be taking a look at three leaders who took power during a very big crisis and basically exploited people's fear for their own gain. So this is how liberty dies, with thunderous applause. A quote by Padme Amidala, senior senator from Naboo, after Chancellor Palpatine announces the rise of the Empire. She, Palpatine, played the long game better than anyone else in the galaxy. From a very young age, Palpatine already had personality traits that would make him a great politician. Had a therapist sat down with him uh, during his adolescence, he probably would have diagnosed Palpatine as a sociopath. Luckily for Palpatine, a immune businessman and Sith Lord by the name of Higo Damas recruited him as his protege. Together, they would establish Palpatine's political career using their immense funding and backroom negotiation skills. Palpatine quickly rose from the Senate to the Supreme Chancellor position. The Republic at the time was at the tail end of a millennia of peace, which meant that they had no standing army. And so Palpatine and Higo Damas methodically started poking and prodding around in the outer rim of the galaxy, trying to stir up trouble and chaos, which the Republic Judicial Forces and Jedi were ill-equipped to handle because they are completely understaffed for their job. Palpatine and Higo Damas continued to stress the strained relationship between the outer rim and the deep core of the galaxy. Ultimately, Palpatine's own apprentice, Count Dooku, would establish a secessionist movement backed by a powerful droid army. Palpatine and his lieutenant, Mass Amida, tricked the gullible, or perhaps hyper-aware Sith Lord, Jar Jar Binks, into passing a motion on the floor of the Senate to give Palpatine emergency powers during this period of crisis. This passes and gives Palpatine the ability to create a military. This, of course, further escalates the Clone Wars, which lasts for four years. Throughout the conflict, Palpatine quietly and deftly moves more power into the executive branch. Not only is he in charge of the military, but the last year of the war, he has seized control of the intergalactic banking clans and nationalized them completely. This allowed Palpatine to further increase the size of the military. Finally, Palpatine, through some careful maneuvering, goads the Jedi into attacking him and his office, which leads to the destruction of the Jedi Order. Palpatine, having survived the assassination attempt, uses his political momentum to declare the rise of the Empire. His mandate is to bring stability to the galaxy and keep everyone safe. The Galactic Republic had been a bureaucratic mess, but it was also a very robust representative democracy. It's frightening to see just how quickly one man can dismantle that by using conflict and danger to push people into giving him complete control. 
In an alternative version of the world, the Labour Party wins the UK general election in 1983. This leads to the disarmament of the United Kingdom's entire nuclear stockpile, which turns out to be a great decision because in 1988, an international nuclear war destroyed much of the Earth, sparing the UK from any direct attacks. But being isolated on an island does not protect the UK from radioactive fallouts, and there is significant damage to the UK's environment and agricultural industry. Eventually, this leads to food shortages and economic recession and widespread unrest. Like most of the world, the United Kingdom's government would collapse. At the height of all of this chaos, a terrible bioweapon is unleashed on the public, starting a viral epidemic that kills over 80,000 people. By 1992, a new political movement has arisen and it's very much prepared for this post-apocalyptic world. They call themselves Norse Fire, and using all of the chaos and terror attacks to instill fear into the populace, began to spread their fascist message. Which quickly grew in popularity, after all, they were the only ones that seemed like they had a solution to this big problem. Former MP Adam Sutler was the face of the Norse Fire Party. At one time in his life, he was just the young, devoutly religious upcoming politician within the Conservative Party. Now he was vying for control of the entire United Kingdom. Norse Fire ends up winning a general election with 87% of the votes. The Norse Fire regime partnering with surviving corporate interests were able to quickly militarize the police and bring things back under their control. They also threw all Africans, Asians, Jews, Muslims, homosexuals, and leftists in concentration camps where they left them to die. The regime was able to quickly wipe out all of their enemies in resistance in several months. They then partnered with the Church of England and established their own massive propaganda network in order to shape the narrative amongst the public. They followed that by building a surveillance state using massive amounts of security cameras, all controlled by a scary supercomputer system named FATE. To make matters even more terrifying, it's rumored that the Norse Fire Party were the ones behind the massive bioweapon attack that got them into power in the first place. Andrew Ryan was born in a village near Minsk, which at the time was a part of the Russian Empire. During the Russian Revolution in 1917, the Bolsheviks came to power and destroyed Ryan's meager family business. His aunt and uncle were executed right in front of him because of their connection with his father, who was a resistance fighter. Ryan's experience in the Soviet Union shaped his personal philosophy. He believed in individualism, self-responsibility, and the free market. He saw communists and socialists as parasites. By 1919, Ryan had reached the United States and was prepared to start his own version of the American dream. Ryan was pleased to see that his intelligence and hard work would be fairly rewarded in this country. He became quite rich after striking oil on his property and carefully invested the money he gained afterwards. When the 1930s arrived along with the Great Depression, Ryan was dismayed to see Franklin Delano Roosevelt roll out his New Deal. Ryan believed that one could only own what they earned, and so when the National Parks and Services Department came to his house and asked to nationalize the forest behind his home, Ryan essentially set the entire forest on fire so that no one could have it. Finally, the dropping of the Hiroshima atomic bomb convinced Ryan that humanity was beyond saving. The idea of using science for such destructive purposes was the ultimate corruption in his worldview. And so Ryan sets out to create an underworld utopia known as the Rapture. It was a place where, quote, the artists would not fear the censor, where the scientists would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small. At first, things became exceptionally well. Rapture was sort of like an Atlantis on Earth. It was a place where the best artists, scientists, and doctors all gathered and created miraculous inventions and scientific breakthroughs. However, Andrew Ryan's style of governing, which could only be described as rule of law in the jungle in a commercial setting, started creating massive gaps between the strong and the weak. Society became increasingly stratified and people were starting to identify by their class instead of citizens of rapture. Eventually, a convict by the name of Frank Fontaine saw an advantage in exploiting the social friction in rapture's underwater society. He established the Fontaine's home for the poor. In an environment without any social safety nets, such charity organizations were the only things that the impoverished could turn to. This essentially gave Frank control over the poorest individuals in rapture society. 
Fontaine's power, both financially and politically, had grown to such an extent that the underwater city was now on the verge of war and power struggle. Frank started smuggling contraband and created a lucrative black market trading business. With his profits, began investing in the atom industry. Atom was a chemical substance that had the ability to rewrite genetic material and give humans essentially superpowers. Ryan, who was a strong believer in a completely free market and very limited government intervention, basically let Fontaine do whatever he wanted until it was too late. You see, Fontaine's power, both financially and politically, had grown to such an extent that the underwater city was now on the verge of war and power struggle. Ryan would basically go against his own personal philosophy and the founding principles of Rapture. He sends his private police after Fontaine and his businesses and even nationalizes Fontaine Futuristics. Andrew Ryan finally had become aware of the dangers of having no government regulation. Adam and the plasmids made from them were causing some serious issues in society. They were apparently very addictive and those suffering from withdrawal from Adam went insane and started killing everyone. This is because on Rapture, there were no government agencies to test the safety of these products before they were released to the wider public. Each individual and corporation were basically responsible for their own well-being. The nationalization of Fontaine Futuristics by Andrew Ryan shocked the citizens of the underwater city. He was supposed to be anti-big government, but by the time the Rapture Civil War had started, he'd become a full-on dictator. So there you have it guys, three different individuals who used three different methods to seize control over their uh, individual nations. Obviously these are some pretty extreme fictional cases and hopefully we won't see anything that crazy in the next few months, but we do have to be vigilant um, and also rational when we're looking at giving away our liberties or freedoms uh, because it's pretty hard to get back stuff when you give it away. But at the same time, we do have to consider the safety of everyone around us, including the most vulnerable people. All I ask is that we all try to be as rational as possible in the coming months and try to stay safe and help and support one another. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.